Hey everybody, welcome to the latest episode of How to Build a Game Studio. Uh, I am Trevor Oz, and I am joined this week by the head of our studio, Ken Gamble. Hey. And our programmer extraordinaire, Jack Steele. What's up, guys? How come I'm not an extraordinaire? I'm just a head. I want to be an extraordinary head. That's. I don't think that's a real title. Whatever you want, man. <laughs> My title can be whatever I want, damn it. <laughs> See, he's drunk with power every time. <laughs> I'm going right now. I'm going to change it. <laughs> My official title, Extraordinary Head. People are like, what do you do? <laughs> I guess now I need to make an update to the website. <laughs> yep. And then people will be confused as to what what's this guy doing here? It's a strange uh, business card. <laughs> <laughs> it'll just be a picture of my head and it'll say extraordinary <laughs> under it that's all the information on it no contact information nothing that's it that well i mean if your head's big enough they'll be able to find it they will anyway got us a little off the rails sorry i got excited about extraordinary head cards uh so so speaking of of head and minds and brains uh, there are brains in video games, and that leads to where you need to teach them artificial intelligence, which is what you've been working on, Ken. That was an awful segue. Yeah, that was, that was a reach. A bad, like, <laughs> that I don't know. was an amazing segue. <laughs> we got to work on your heuristics. <laughs> no one else could have done that segue. Anyway, yeah, um, so ignoring Trevor's terrible segue, just a uh, quick update on the state of things. Again, we're, you know, if you listen to us, you know that we can't really share anything quite yet, but I am working currently on uh, AI, um, just kind of our initial first run and getting the uh, the enemy characters in there to do a little more than stand still and be punching bags. Um, and yeah, it's actually, it's a pretty big step forward in kind of getting us where we want to go. Um, it's been interesting for me because I have no experience whatsoever doing AI. Um, I, you know, I had a class in it in pool sale when I went. Um, so I learned a little bit there, but in any of our projects, I never focused on the AI. I never really did any AI in our uh, in my professional career either. So it's been kind of a big learning curve, but it is really interesting to work with and just kind of seeing things start to happen in this discipline I'm not used to has been pretty amazing. So uh, yeah, it's a little slower going than kind of the other features I was working on previously, but um we're still on schedule and on track, which is nice. And uh, seeing things come together, kind of doing these different disciplines of coding that I'm not used to has been a really great learning experience. So hopefully everyone will be excited when we finally get to the point that we can actually showcase everything we've been working on. Yeah, for sure. Um, so it's your first time working on AI. Um, what kind of tools are you using to kind of teach yourself uh, how to dive in there? Uh, it's been just a lot of kind of open-ended research. Um, just like I went back to the class I mentioned before, my AI class at Full Sail, and looked through a bunch of old slides to kind of re-familiarize myself with some of the general theory behind it. Um, we're not you know, the, with the game, we're certainly not doing anything as intense as neural networking or, you know, machine learning or anything like that. Um, because actually, it's pretty interesting. A lot of the research I've done um, has kind of showcased that it's better in a game to kind of have a, I, I hate to use the term, but stupid AI um, versus a really smart AI. And that's not with respect to like the AI being bad in games. That's with respect to just general how the AI works. Because if you have a smart AI, it becomes very predictable. It actually becomes um, 
kind of boring to play against because it always just does kind of what is the best option, like 100% of the time. And so that ends up just really being the player kind of getting into this formulaic, oh, I know this is about to happen. I know that's going to do this X, Y, or Z. Whereas if you make it a quote unquote dumb AI, it actually makes the game a little more interesting because it adds this element of randomness. They're not always just doing the 100% perfect, most optimal move for every turn and for every kind of action. There's a little bit of randomness that keeps you off guard and makes it seem more like not that you're playing against another player, but that you're actually playing against someone with kind of almost a human style intelligence. So that's been a really interesting thing because really early in my implementation, you know, my, my kind of first pass was just always do optimal stuff, no randomization, whatever. And it was, it was just boring. It was, I know where everyone's going to move. I know what everything is going to happen. And uh, it just became kind of more about, can I defeat this enemy given these parameters? And you almost know the outcome of everything you're going to do early on. Um, whereas there's a little more randomness now, and it's actually a lot more fun to play against, even in this early stages. So I'm hoping that once I get to the point where I'm implementing kind of the, uh, the behavior system that I have in my mind I want to create, it's going to make enemies actually a lot more unique and kind of interesting to play against. That's that's really cool. Uh, I would have never thought that there'd be a big difference between you know a smart AI and a dumb AI, and um, pretty much in how the dumb AI is actually uh, somewhat better. So yeah, it's just known it's the difference. Of, to be completely honest, it's a lot of uh, you know me reading up on people who are a lot more experienced in the subject than I am and sharing their knowledge. Um, with kind of what has worked and what hasn't worked. It's, it's kind of like if you think about chess as an example, um, if you're playing against a, you know, smart AI, which I'm, you know, like the actual AI learning computers that they use, I think like, um, I forget the name of the, the really famous AI, chess playing AI, but like those are smart AI where you're going to lose unless you are a chess genius. Um, whereas the dumb AI, you know, is actually going to kind of be more reactive and more interactive with the player versus kind of planning out the entire game in advance. So, you know, it's and it's really interesting having a couple different levers for moving things kind of in one direction or the other. Um, and seeing how these different behaviors impact different units in the game. It's, it's, I don't know, it's interesting to me considering I haven't really worked with this before, but I, I think it's turning out pretty well in these early stages. And and I think in the long run that'll make things better, um, knowing that, because, uh, I mean, we've all played a bunch of, you know, turn-based strategy games and had it to where no matter what we do, it's the same thing every time. Um, but you know, we've, I, I prefer the ones where it's like, well, what if I try this strategy differently? And then it kind of reacts in turn. So, yeah, I'm hoping to give enemies enough personality isn't quite the right word, but enough, um, identity as an enemy to allow players to essentially learn kind of what their behavioral patterns are going to be and prepare for that. Because uh, that'll give players like a really sense of of learning, advancement, and empowerment um, in the game. To where you know, after you've played however many hours of the game, you're gonna kind of know what these different patterns are and be able to plan appropriately and change your tactics to better address what their tactics would be, but still have enough in the randomness department that is not going to be boring. They could always change and do something unexpected. Yeah, I think that's a, I think that's a good approach. Um, and I like how uh, you're using outside resources to uh, learn more about AI. And I think that's one of the big things that me and Joe Mirabella talked about when I had him on the podcast was 
just being able to adapt and learn new things on the fly. It seems like you're doing that. Yeah, that's a, that's a big difference between kind of my experience when in AAA and, you know, being in the indie space is the fact that in AAA, a lot of times you're more kind of focused on one discipline or, you know, like I was a UI programmer or, you know, gameplay programmer, rendering engineer, like a, a ton of different things. But uh, you kind of focused more, you branched out a little bit often, but you focused heavily on your kind of chosen discipline. And there was a, almost always someone, unless you were a lead or a senior, there was always somebody above you could go to get assistance. Whereas in the indie space, you like, I really only have outside resources at this point. Right. I don't really have anyone I can turn to. Um, that has a lot of experience unless like Jack knows something that I haven't or like for a specific discipline or whatever. Um, but yeah, that's been a pretty big change getting used to going out there and like finding these resources and talking to people and half the time just winging it, you know, and you can't find what, what you need, but yeah, it's a different skill set, but, I still am able to draw a lot on what I've learned in the past, thankfully. And thank God I still have a lot of slides from Full Sail um, that cover kind of the theory of things from back in school. Yeah, it was a pretty smart idea to keep that stuff. That's for sure. I know not a lot of people <laughs> would still have their school stuff, especially 10 years later. So, Yeah, absolutely. It's it's great reference to go back to. But yeah, uh, so yeah, that's uh, that's the state of the studio for now. Working on the artificial intelligence, making stuff smart or dumb, as we've surmised. Dumbly um, smart. <laughs> exactly. Um, so anyway, uh, this week uh, we we wanted a, a new topic. So I was thinking a little bit about it, and I was thinking about um, changes in sequels and stuff. And since we're a company that's focused on RPGs, I wanted to talk about uh, games that, that had sequels that were pretty different from their originals. Uh, so basically changes between an RPG and its sequel um, and what we can talk about there. Uh, so uh, let's start with uh, with you, Kent. What, what do you think is one that comes to mind? Um, so the first one that comes to mind for me in that case is it's more of a negative one, but it's uh, going from the first Dragon Age game into the second Dragon Age game. Um, so Origins versus Dragon Age 2. And I'm sure some people like the changes, you know, going into 2, but personally, I really did not like them. And so specifically what I'm talking about is the Dragon Age Origins was really, really heavily focused on kind of the tactical aspect. Um, you moved your characters more. It was more of a cursor base, and you would choose um, almost like behaviors for all your AI party members. So it's like, if I drop below 90% health, then do this. If an enemy does this, do this. You know, focus your attack first on archers, then on uh, mages, and so on and so forth. And so the the game was really tactical and kind of you kind of took a further step back from things, almost like you were controlling the squad. Um, whereas in Dragon Age 2, they changed pretty heavily to a much more kind of action-oriented uh, combat system to where you were actually like controlling your one unit and you know jamming on the attack button to launch your attacks. And uh, for me, that took a lot away from it like it was still a pretty interesting game i enjoyed it um it's definitely my least favorite in the dragon age series which mm -hmm. i love the series but like origins and inquisition were both so much better than the second one um and i think it wasn't so much that there was a problem with the story or the characters or anything it was just that kind of the change from what i had learned to absolutely love from the first game and that combat system into that more action-oriented style really uh, rubbed me the wrong way. 
I I almost feel with Dragon Age 2, they were trying to do what they did with another RPG that we were definitely going to bring up, which was Mass Effect 1 to Mass Effect 2. And that's where they, they took it from being straight RPG, because in, in Mass Effect 1, I mean, yes, you did actually you know shoot each shot, but it was all based on stats. So a lot of people didn't like it that you would shoot someone in the head, but it might not actually be a headshot because you didn't have the stat that backed it up. Um, essentially, because they were going with stats and RPGs, it was more closer to you know Knights of the Old Republic um, in that style. Um, but I think with Dragon Age to Dragon Age Two, they were trying, they were attempting to do the same thing, but I don't think it worked as well within the setting of of the Dragon Age universe as it did in Mass Effect, being science fiction and using guns and. Um, I think they actually did a good job uh, in a positive way between Mass Effect 1 and Mass Effect 2 uh, to make the gameplay more compelling. Yeah, I mean, I'm you know me, I'm the guy who loves the kind of like RPG style game, but yeah, I, I, Mass Effect 2, the gameplay of Mass Effect 2 was definitely better than the original. I have some issues with the story, that will forever drive me nuts about Mass Effect 2, but overall the changes were very, very positive. Yeah, and I, I think I think that's a, what they were attempting to do with Dragon Age. It just didn't work out as well. But I think I think Dragon Age 2, like overall, isn't a bad game. It just wasn't as good as the first or the third. So Yeah, um, I would agree with that. I mean it's also the first, like the third one, they kind of found the balance, I think. The first yeah. one which is my favorite, I totally see the fact that it was a pretty niche kind of system for, you know, compared to the more kind of mid-action oriented that yeah. I'm sure most people prefer. But, you know, for me, I want that. I want tactics all day. Well, I, I think I think in, in their point, too, is that the original Dragon Age was their spiritual successor to Baldur's Gate, um, where... It was, you know, the old school top-down CRPG, except they were trying to modernize it a bit more with the original Dragon Age. So I think anybody that had an affinity for that or old school RPGs would probably be more into that, um, which makes a whole lot of sense um, in what they were trying to do. So, Agreed. so yeah, the, the, the first one is probably my favorite as well um, out of the Dragon Ages. For sure. What about you, Jack? Yeah, that's actually the only one I'd played. I didn't actually play two or three, but I really enjoyed that uh, combat style of one. Just because it did remind me so much of Knights of the Old Republic, and I just wanted more of that. Yeah, Knights of the Old Republic uh, definitely... <coughs> def Give us another one. one of my favorites, so. Damn it. Where is my KOTOR 3? Yeah. <laughs> Well, they would tell you that they did it, but it was the old <laughs> but Yeah, the MMO didn't quite do it for me. Yeah, again, it's you know it's an MMO, so it's got to follow certain things to get MMO players into it. So you're going to have a different kind of RPG with that. So, but hope uh, you know you never know, you never know. I mean, it's now that. Uh, Star Wars can and and Disney's Disney owns it and they're putting out you know they're throwing Marvel games at all these different studios who knows what they'll do with Star Wars some somewhere down the line you never know that someone could pick that up and make a new RPG so hey man if I uh I'm getting a Shenmue 3 after how many years I don't doubt anything anymore finally yeah anything's possible <laughs> so I will just believe going forward that I can get a sequel or a continuation of the games that I want. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, <laughs> trust me, Shenmue 3 I was surprised about as well. So, um, all, There's been a lot of surprises in the past couple of years, to be completely honest. I never thought we'd ever see that Final Fantasy remake for 7 either, so even though people clamored for it for a long time. Yeah, I expected a remaster. I did not expect a remake. Yeah, yeah, same here. But yeah, it's happening. So, 
but yeah, uh, so that's that's Dragon Age and Mass Effect. Uh, Jack, are there any that come to your mind? Uh, I was trying to think of some, and I know this is a series that I brought up like way too much in these podcast <laughs> episodes, but uh, the Fable series was a, a pretty big one for me. Uh, they all followed like pretty much the same combat and the same like open world concept, uh, but there were just a few things in between each one that. Uh, I thought it was pretty cool and added a lot of, like, unique aspect to the game. Like, uh, from 1 to 2, where uh, I can't... I, at least I don't think in 1 that you could purchase property. Do you guys remember? Um, I'm not sure. I think you could, but I think it was, like, very select. Okay, maybe that was it. Because, yeah, I definitely remember in 2 just going from... Like, instead of making your money adventuring, you just make your money from becoming, like, a slumlord and just yeah. buying up every possible property <laughs> in the world. They like, definitely the had, like, world. better overall, kind of almost like a management sim-style sub-game yeah. um, in 2. But it's been a long time since I've played them, so I can't remember for sure. Yeah, and I thought uh, in 2 it was pretty cool how they, like, expanded a, a little more... And uh, brought in, like, a few little thing references to other games. Like, I know you could even get, like, as a ranged weapon, you could get the uh, the assault rifle from Halo. And you could equip that. I thought that was, that was like, one of the first times that I saw an actual, like, in-game weapon that was clearly a reference to a, a whole other game that I also loved. So uh, I thought that was pretty cool. Uh, and then from 2 to 3, they actually took it even another step further and you end up be having the ability to just become the king of the entire like region and so then you have to it's similar to the whole uh property system but instead you have to like manage um keeping people happy managing the budget of the kingdom uh, and then by the end of the game you had to have like a certain uh like value in the kingdom treasury or else you like started losing you couldn't save as many people as you wanted to if you didn't have enough money built up for uh defenses or whatever whatever you had to buy with it but i thought that was pretty cool too when they added that in yeah i agree yeah. i always like that kind of management sim overlay on top of a solid rpg game yeah it's kind of it's kind of interesting that they went that direction too um because it's uh, Fable was very much uh, action oriented, so it's just interesting that they also went with the with the sim portion. But it actually totally makes sense uh, based on the studio that made the game. Yeah, I thought they ended up pulling it off pretty well, not making it like all about that, but just adding to the game. Yeah, for sure. Um, so I think I, I have one that I just thought of that it probably should have been, like, right there in front of my face. But uh, Fallout 2 to Fallout 3. That's, oh, yeah, that's probably the most I drastic one. I don't know why <laughs> yeah. I didn't think of that. <laughs> Me neither. I have a... I know I'm going to sound like such an asshole here, but, like, I often forget that the new Fallout games are Fallout games, because when you say Fallout to me, I just... It's one and two, like... I immediately go back to those ones because I, I love that style of game. Not and I, three and four are, and seventy six. I actually like all of them. I think they're all fine games, but like, it's such a. When I hear the word Fallout, I immediately go back to Fallout Two, which is one of my favorite games of all time. So, that's an excellent, uh, excellent pick there, Trevor. Yeah, uh, I mean, just thinking about it, it goes from a very very like action like action or like turn based like I don't even know how to describe it because it's it's turn based but it's all based on the number of actions and you know action points and um it's more intense strategy <laughs> than uh strategy than, all day yeah hashtag strategy all day <laughs> There's my hashtag for the uh, for the podcast episode. <laughs> but yeah, it's it's way more of a strategy game um, with RPG elements than you know than a straight RPG. So it's interesting how 
when Bethesda was able to take the reins, how they changed it uh, from that into um, essentially a you know wasteland version of an Elder Scrolls game, but um, while still keeping true to what made those originals uh, unique, at least at least with the setting and and the and the monsters and uh, characters, um, the VAT system, like all that stuff, um, kind of stayed true to the original. So it, it was a huge leap, um, but it, it, it worked out for them. I agree. Although I'd still totally be down for Fallout returning to its roots. Well, you kind of, you kind of get some of that. I mean, the Wasteland games, right? That's actually, I I love the Wasteland games. I'm so excited for three coming out. Um, but yeah, that basically Wasteland gives me my fix now. So you you still you get the best of both worlds now. You get the new the all the all the people that want the new games get that, and then all the people that still clamor for that old school action get the Wasteland games. So I think it I think it all worked out for everybody in the end. Um, but I mean, it just makes you think too. Um, while Fallout Three to Four isn't a big leap, um, the Elder Scrolls games have seen several big leaps. Um, whether that's from like the original, like Arena and Daggerfall into Morrowind, and then from Morrowind to Oblivion, Oblivion to Skyrim, they've all seen pretty drastic changes. Is number one. <laughs> I know you like Morrowind the best, but <laughs> number one forever. Um, yeah, no, you're you're totally right on that. Where, like, the core, the, the the thing that they've really done a great job with is keeping the core the same, but like everything surrounding that core has been changed a lot down the years um for each installment i'm really curious kind of what they're going to do with six is it going to be you know essentially skyrim in a new setting which would be disappointing kind of surprising like i assume that they'll do what they do best and kind of reinvent it but keeping the core um yeah, I don't, I don't know but, what they'll do with it. it. Yeah, it'll be kind of interesting to see what they can do, though. I mean, Skyrim's just like this juggernaut, and it's, it's easily their most popular Elder Scrolls game, um, other than maybe online. I don't, but Skyrim has to be pop- more popular than online, yeah, even though thirty versions they've released of it. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Yep. Like it comes out on everything. It's even on Alexa. So. Yep. <laughs> which is ridiculous and actually really awesome. <laughs> yeah, I actually when I what was that last year's E3, I think. I remember that being like well done for kind of rolling with the punches. Yeah, it it it's actually a, a really fun stupid romp through Elder Scrolls doing it that way. Um <laughs> cuz I've played a bit of that uh complete completely different than anything else but yeah they, i mean they've been smart about it um they do they're really smart about changing things they did a good job of taking that core and finally i think making it mainstream with skyrim oh absolutely whereas the other games are far less mainstream yeah yeah i mean i, I think oblivion like kind of almost gets there but it kind of like I don't think it quite hits it for everybody, but Skyrim was just the point. I think that everybody was just like, okay, I get it now. <laughs> so. I do really wish that they bring back a lot of the old features. Cause like they've st- fairly steadily removed features from the game in order to make it kind of more mainstream. And mm-hmm. I wish they'd bring back a lot of them, but it's fine. Like, essentially to have them in such a way that it's not going to interfere with people that prefer like Skyrim yeah. now. Giving you the option. But, yeah. Because like, there's so much that I miss from the earlier games that just, it just doesn't exist anymore from like, you know, the 
potions of levitation or in Morrowind, the, the boots that you could jump across the continent or, you know, they had a lot, many more styles of weapons. So like you could be proficient in long blades, short blades, spears, like you could equip different pauldrons of totally different types on your character. Just a lot of options that don't exist anymore that I really miss. Um, but obviously the kind of the core gameplay and like combat of Skyrim is way better. It kind of goes back to the, what you mentioned in Mass Effect earlier, where in Morrowind you could be stabbing or shooting an arrow into somebody and it just, it doesn't actually connect, even though visually you just shot an arrow in his head. Um, so it'd be nice to see a little bit of that come back, but keep the kind of good, solid, more actiony gameplay of the newer ones. Yeah, I, I would agree with you there. Because um, I, I think the the strength in Skyrim is definitely in its combat. Because um, it, it, I mean, essentially, it feels like you're in control of your character and actually making those moves. You know, you're swinging the sword. You're, you know, even even so much that they were like, hey, let's put this in VR. And they did. And I still actually really want to try it in VR just because, like, I think it would be really cool. To actually feel like I'm, you know, in that world. So. Everyone will just think you're nuts because you'll be running around your house screaming shouts. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Although I guess they already did that with uh, the Connect version. Yeah. That you could just, because I remember testing that out when it came out and you just screaming Foos Roda at things. It's kind Dude. of interesting. I, like... I, I saw like just an article in passing today about somebody somebody working on uh, voice based games. Um, I just saw a Twitter post from like Gama Sutra talking about it, and I was like, man, like some of the best stuff of the original Connect were those games that had just that voice voice capability in games, um, and, and it it was like one of those like small features that just worked really well but that like no one ever thought thought about like after because there were a ton of games that just had like voice commands and stuff um what was that tom clancy was it end war where you, like, yeah. you could completely like control your army just with voice commands like that was some cool stuff um and that just kind of all went away because of you know Everybody just rejecting Connect at the beginning of this cycle. Yeah, it was unfortunately pretty short lived, but there were some really cool features. I hate the fact that I have to turn on my freaking TV. Like, for me, the ability that I could turn on the Xbox and then the Connect would turn on and turn off the TV was pretty much the best thing ever for a lazy person. <laughs> yep. Yeah, I'm. I'm with you, man. Like, I. I. I was sold on Connect. Man, I was sold on the whole Xbox One thing. Like, I miss, I miss the snap feature so yeah. much. Oh yeah. Because I used to love just sitting there, like watching. Because I, I have my cable box connected to my Xbox, so like I would sit there and watch TV while playing a game. Like, now I can't really do that unless I, you know, decide to put another screen next to my TV or like pull my laptop over or something and do it. But, you know, it's just. How things go, things change. There's another big uh, difference between the Fable One, Two, and Three, and Fable: The Journey. <laughs> Speaking oh, yeah. of Connect, that's yeah, true. Connect spinoff. I forgot about that one. <laughs> it's not really a sequel. It's it's like you said, a spinoff. Yeah, that like rail shooter. Mm -hmm. But yeah, they 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 tried to do some interesting stuff with that. Uh, but yeah, I completely forgot about the shouts. Um, with the connect in Skyrim, um, but I totally did them for sure. Yeah, it was a neat little thing. Yeah, like that. That was that was like kind of the, <laughs> that was the cool era where like the Xbox versions I loved to see because they had different things like that. So I, I like uh, even Splinter Cell had it to like um, where if you made noise like, in real life with the connect there, then the enemies would hear it and stuff like that, so. Yeah, until your asshole friend just sits behind you going, hey, hey, over here, 
hey, look over here. <laughs> Pretty much, yeah. I would have spent hours doing that to you. I Trevor. definitely did that to my old roommate, yeah. <laughs> 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 Just to mess with <laughs> But yeah, uh, are there any others that you guys can think of? Um, I don't have big things on them because it's been a ridiculous amount of years since I've played them. But um, go Shining Force two to Shining Force three. Um, there were, you know, the big one was going two D to three D um, from the Genesis to the Saturn, but. Um, there were also just a lot of really cool features I remember they added in Shining Force 3. Um, so they added kind of like the buddy system where as you, you know, which nowadays is a pretty common one. But as you fight mm -hmm. with your buddy, you kind of form a friendship or a bond and then you were able to unleash special attacks. Um, they had multi-part battles, which was cool, where like you would have to divide your squad up and each squad would need to win their section of the battle to win the overall battle um just some really cool features there and then dragon uh, it's it's dragon quest now but back when i played it it was dragon warrior on the nes so from one to two was a really big leap in the fact that like dragon warrior one you were kind of solo um the game like fully solo the all you had to worry about was your one character. The The core kind of combat stayed really similar. But when they went to two, you ended up getting um, a small party with you, which I thought was really cool. It added a lot to the game. And then when they went to three, they actually had, like, I think it was a mostly customizable party where, aside from the main character, you would pick, I think it was three guys to, to party with. And um, you would actually just customize them completely. So you would choose their, their class, their name, you know, everything. And you could kind of swap your characters in and out at the adventuring guild or whatever it was. So it was a really cool uh, kind of big changes going between those three games uh, that I don't remember if I like two or three. But generally speaking, it was all super positive in the direction they went. So I wanted to give them a shout out and I apologize to anyone who's listening. Who's like, Oh, he's totally said that wrong. It's been, I don't know, 20 years since I've played them. You can, uh, you, can send, <laughs> you can send your corrections to uh, social media, winterborn games. <laughs> yeah. Someone's <laughs> fact checking you right now. <laughs> yeah. They're like this dumb ass. <laughs> <laughs> Get the facts, man. Got me some slack. I've, I've played these. I played these games on the original NES. I have not played them like in an emulated fashion anywhere. So it's been a long time, and my memory sucks anyway. So, <laughs> uh, Jack, I was just gonna say, if there's anything the internet's known for, it's cutting people slack. So <laughs> I feel pretty yeah. pretty safe. Exactly what they do. They cut people slack. Oh yeah. Uh, <laughs> Jack, are there any others you can think of? Uh, I had one series that's sort of a similar situation as those where it, I hadn't played them in years, but uh, I loved like the Breath of Fire series. Oh, I don't yeah. know if you guys ever played those, but like how in I want to say it was two, they added in that feature where you could like start town building, yeah. like building your own hero's town, and I thought that was cool. That was like one of the first games that I had experienced that in. And then uh, my favorite one though was when they got to four. Because, like, they totally redid the art style on it. I thought it was, like, a beautiful game. And they added in the ab uh, the ability where, like, one of the main goals your character had was to go around. And I think you just went around defeating these different dragons. And then once you defeated that dragon, you gained the ability to, like, transform into, like, a ver like your own character's version of that dragon. So you, like, transform into different forms. Uh, similar to, like, uh, The Legend of Dragoon which was another one of my, like, all-time favorite RPGs. Uh, so when they added that into, I just fell in love with that game. Oh, yeah. Those were great games. I haven't played any in a long time, but yeah, at least the Super Nintendo ones are some of my favorite games. Yeah, I don't think I ever played any of those. I just missed them. Oh, yeah, they were really good. I'd definitely recommend 
Yeah, the, there's just such a big catalog of RPGs out there that that just were released on on those systems and just have not seen the light of day since. Yeah, right. And like those generations have yeah. like the best games, like Super, like Super Nintendo, and like and PS One had like a ton of good RPGs that just like have not been seen since. And it's it's uh it's kind of a shame. Well, just win the lottery and buy the IPs. Yeah, simple as that. Yeah, that's easy. <laughs> All right, Square Enix, I'm coming for you. Because <laughs> <laughs> most of these games were made by Square or Enix. Yeah. Was Breath of Fire Capcom? I think it was, yeah. I actually think that one is Capcom. Those are Capcom. I think you're right. Yeah. I mean, who knows who, if they, I assume they still own the IP. I'd be surprised, but. Yeah, I think they stopped at, after they made like five on PS2, I think it was. But it was like a whole, a very different game, and the series kind of died after that, I think. Yeah, it seems like a, a, a some series did have that big change that that almost like killed them off. Like, uh, like I know Suikoden had like a few on PS2, but I haven't played any of them, so I couldn't tell you the big differences. Um, but I yeah. know they, I know they never like they were never as popular as the second one for that mm-hmm. series. The moral of this story is if you're going to drastically change the game make sure it works yeah yeah that's true that's true uh anyway i I think that uh i think that'll do us do it for us this week guys and uh i want to thank jack and kent for both being on today yeah Yeah, extraordinary head (laughs) (laughs) kent is extraordinary head um being on the podcast um and we want to thank you guys so much for listening um the podcast somehow keeps growing and growing. Um, it's very exciting. Yeah, that's awesome. And we are we are very excited about it. And uh, thank you guys uh, for listening. Um, again, if you're an indie game developer like us, uh, feel free to reach out to me uh, at social media at winterborngames.com, and we can see about getting you on the podcast, um, and we can talk about your studio. Um, if you're just a game developer and you have stuff that you think would be interesting for the audience, we'll... We'll definitely uh, have you on too. So just uh, reach out, um, and if you're just uh, a listener and like what we're doing, uh, just get, again email us social media winterborngames.com. Uh, you can find us on Twitter, Instagram, and Facebook at Winterborn Games. Uh, if you message any of those, uh, I will see it uh, because I see everything, um, and because I have alerts set up that tell me when stuff happens. Um, so. Uh, Anyway, guys, uh, thank you all uh, for listening, and we'll be back next week. Goodbye. Later.